Today is July 14th, 2015. We are at the 9th Judicial Circuit Conference in San Diego, California. Uh, we are here today to interview Judge Morrison England Jr. in a brief video oral history to record some reflection on his career in the law. My name is Brad Williams and I'm here on behalf of the 9th Judicial Circuit Historical Society. This interview will be preserved in the NJCHS archives and the Historical Society will provide you, Your Honor, with a copy for your own use. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. Um, I understand that you were born in St. Louis. Yes. But you were raised in Sacramento. Yes, my parents actually moved uh, from St. Louis to Sacramento when I was about five years old. They were educators. <clears throat> and. Uh, the opportunities in California at the time were very good and they had a number of friends that were here and they both um, began teaching in various schools in the Sacramento area. And what high school did you go to? In C.K. McClatchy High School in Sacramento. Name, name for, the, for the publisher, right? Name for the publisher and it's uh, kind of the hotbed of judges in, uh, in Sacramento because uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy went to C.K. McClatchy. Uh, the Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, Tony Cantil Sakaue, also went to C.K. McClatchy. And I can't even begin to name all the number of judges that have come out of that high school. That's a distinguished alumni. It's a very distinguished alumni, yes. It's amazing. That's, that's, that's great. Um, when you graduated from, from uh, high school, well, I guess in high school you played some football, is that right? Yes, I did. Um, what position? I was an offensive tackle then. Mm -hmm. um, I was a little bit younger. I graduated when I was 16, so I was played when I was younger than after going through a high school. I went to uh, Sacramento City College and started there at age 16 playing football, which was interesting at the time because in 1971 we were getting a lot of the veterans coming back from Vietnam who were on the GI Bill, who would be 21, 22, which to me was an old person. Right. But uh, it, was, uh, it was a great learning experience, very much learning experience. So you played some football at, at City College. Yes, I ended up playing there one year, and I think it was because of the fact that I was a little young um, that I stopped playing and, and took a year off, actually, and went to work for the California Department of Motor Vehicles and uh, knew I needed to get back into college. And so I went back the following year in 1973. And I, I put on maybe 40 pounds, lifted weights, done a lot of things. Um, and it worked out. Mm -hmm. I ended up being all conference, all state, and um, all American at Sac City. And so that's what started me into the football progression. I see. And when you were at City, um, uh, which is a two-year school, uh, did you have plans to go on to um, a four-year school? I did. My plan was to be in pre-med. And I think it was either organic or inorganic chemistry that made me realize that that was a fool's folly and that I was not going to be going to pre-med. And I had a very, um, in fact, at that time, my mother was a counselor at Sac City, but um, she and put me in a class with an um, English professor, English 1A, 1B, who actually said, you should go to pre-law. I think that's where you should go. So that's what guided me into the, the law area. I was just a, one professor at Sacramento City. And then I ended up going to the University of the Pacific in Stockton played there and I had a pre-law advisor that actually pushed me into law school. It was very interesting because McGeorge School of Law where I went and where um, Justice Kennedy taught me and a bunch of others in constitutional law was in Sacramento. And so back in that time you could um, recruit differently. So I could visit that institution as much as possible and get to know people. And McGeorge was where I wanted to go to school. Um, it was a beautiful campus and it's right in Sacramento. And they had made a, um, they'd said that, you know, all the athletes that had gone to Pacific who went to McGeorge 
I'll pass the bar the first time. So that's the only stipulation is that you will pass the bar the first time when you go through. And uh, that's how I met Dean Shaver and you know everyone else that was there. So it was kind of a foregone conclusion to go to the undergraduate at University of Pacific in Stockton and then go to the graduate school in Sacramento. And going, going to the graduate school in Sacramento is better than being in Stockton. Yes, it was very nice. I, I did take a little sidetrack. I was thinking football mm -hmm. still, and I, um, after college, uh, I signed a free agent contract with the New York Jets, and that lasted for the preseason. I didn't like that, so I quit, but I came back and started coaching at Cal State Fullerton. And How did that come about, the, co the coaching, at, the coaching at, at, at Cal State <clears throat> with the Titans, who no longer have a football team? Right. Well, my offensive line coach, Jim Coletto, who was a um, UCLA captain of the team that beat Michigan State 14-12 to 12 in the 1965 Rose Bowl, had left Pacific and became the head coach at Cal State Fullerton. And so when I came, out of, uh, came back from New York, he called and said, why don't you come here? I think this might be something good because another one of my teammates was there also. So I started coaching and uh, working on my master's in counseling psychology because that was where I wanted to go, was to go into coaching at some point. Um, Had you forsaken law at this point? It, or put it it on was the there, but it wasn't there. The thing that I will always remember is that across the street from Cal State Fullerton was um, Western State's School of Law. And I would look at it when I was on the field every day and think, I wonder? I'll ever do that. And for some reason, I signed up for the LSAT. And one Saturday morning, I went there and took the LSAT. And I really didn't know where I was going, what was going to happen. Was it football? Was it law? And I was pretty much torn. And um, everyone was going someplace. I mean, I was part of the crew or the people that were um, going coaching in big time. Uh, I went to school when Pete Carroll was there at UOP and you know, the Seahawks, Greg Robinson, for many years at the Denver Broncos defensive coordinator, Ron Turner, you know, head coach at University of Illinois and Chicago. And so we were all in this era of wanting to go on and something happened. I had my um, results from the LSAT sent to McGeorge, and I remember receiving a phone call from a person that I had met in Stockton, Bob Mattos, who was the head coach of Stagg High School, who ran the same offense that we did at Pacific, and I got to know him very well. And he was an alumni of Cal State Sacramento, and he became the head football coach. And he called and said, I'd like for you to come and be my offensive line coach because you know the system that I'm going to run. Well, kind of, you know, what do I do? When am I, when am I going to go? When I got home that night, I had a letter in my mailbox from McGeorge that says, you've been accepted. So I thought, well, this must be an omen. I need to go back to Sacramento. So I went back to Sacramento, um, started coaching football at Sac State, teaching, and um, Coincidentally, Bob's best friend was a lawyer, and he introduced the two of us, and I started clerking with him and his partner, Gary Quatron and Tim Clemens, and Tim's dad, Ray Clemens, had been the head coach at Sac State. He was a well-known person, so I'm back into the football situation, but now I'm also going to law school at night. That's which gotta be hard. It was, and which was the same thing that my two partners had done. But then on top of that, I started working in the graveyard shift at Juvenile Hall. So I was putting a lot of time outside of law school. It wasn't just law school. And I probably my grade showed it, but I made it through. But that part of working in Juvenile Hall is what got me into being a judge in the long run. Interesting. Inter that's very interesting. Um, and I think at some point, a little bit further in time, uh, you become a referee and a judge pro tem. 
it, what happened was, it was almost as a joke, one of my law partners uh, came back from the court and there was an application to be a referee at juvenile court. And at that time, it was maybe one page with eight questions. It was nothing. But it, it put it on my desk and he goes, you should do that. You worked at juvenile hall. Um, I didn't think about it, so I waited for about three or four days and something said, fill it out. Why not? So I filled it out and of course I didn't get it. But about a year later, um, one of the judges at juvenile court said, dude, are you serious about wanting to do this? And I said, well, I would be. And he said, well, it's interesting because you have a background in counseling psychology. Your mother was a psychiatric social worker for a long time and we deal with social workers and dependency court and we have been using DAs and public defenders to represent children who are abused and neglected and they're not criminals or not in that system but we need to get something better and so what we're looking for is a person who has a background in counseling psychology has no experience in criminal law um, who has no, and all these no's and I'm the guy that had no experience in juvenile court, no experience in criminal law. I had the background. And so they asked me to become a pro tem to see this new project, which was that have a person with a civil background be involved in dependency work and understand how social workers work and how this all happens. And so I got started. That's how I started. And... Um, I, I absolutely loved it. I had never, I was not a litigator. I had never had it. I had one jury trial that was a, years before, but it was a short thing, but I was never in court. Not like that, but I absolutely loved it. And uh, as it turned out, I thought this is what I need to do somehow. And there was an opening that was created Someone, I think one of the referees left or something happened and I applied. And everyone, the attorneys were going, oh, you're going to get this. This is written for you. It's totally you. And of course, I didn't get it. And it was because you don't have any experience in criminal law. <laughs> All the things that got me in the first time is what said it didn't happen. Um, another position opened sometime later and they asked me to actually run the courtroom for three months straight in addition to my law practice. So I got up at four in the morning, went to work, did my practice, left at eight, went to the juvenile court, went until four o'clock, went back to my law firm, worked till eight, and I did this for three months. And I thought that this would show that I'm, I want to do this and I, I want to get into that. And of course, didn't get it again. So I kind of gave it up, but then one of the presiding judge came to me and said, you didn't get it because we believe that you should apply to the governor and get a full, for a full judgeship. And I thought, but I, you know, again, I'm always the nevers. I, I don't, I'm not political. I haven't given any money to a governor. I, and I'm not a litigator. I don't, you know, all the reasons why I couldn't make it and then he said apply because I've already written a letter to him and basically four years later it finally came and I was appointed to the municipal court by Governor Pete Wilson and after I was there for maybe three months I got the word you need to apply to the Superior Court. After which, only three months, that's which interesting. Is, and again, I went, no, I can't do it. I don't know. I'm not this. And all the negatives came up again. And it was, no, you need to apply. And uh, almost exactly one year from my first appointment, I was elevated to the Supreme, to the uh, Superior Court. And I thought, you know, I've, this is the epitome of where I want to be. I mean, I'm done. This is it. I mean, I've never in a million years thought I would get to this point. Um, but then things happen. They do. Let me back up just a little bit. I wanted to ask you about a little bit about private practice with Quatrain, Clemens, and England. Mm -hmm. What kinds of clients did you handle? We represented um, 
developers, real estate developers. We worked actually as in-house counsel for a company that was known as FPI, Federal Projects Incorporated, that did a number of um, federally subsidized programs, 221D3 or 221D4 or Section 236 multifamily housing. So it was a very specialized um, area um, of real estate and we had outside developers as well. I got into a little bit more of um, probate corporate work, but it was uh, very much transactional law. Nothing really that got us into court. In fact, we used to always kid around that if we had to go to court over a real estate deal, something was really wrong, so <laughs> we don't need to be there. So uh, that was, that was our, our practice. And that's, that's far different than what you were doing um, in, in the juvenile justice totally, system. Totally, totally different. Yeah. And it was even, then for me to go to uh, the state court, what's the first thing they do? Is they put you in criminal court. And I, I'm having a number overload as far as code sections. What's this worth? How's this going? And I had no idea what to do, but uh, that's changed now. You know, it's, uh, you have a, uh, you have a mentor and things that get you going. But I remember that my uh, first day on the bench was actually sitting next to a judge on the bench, watching him for four hours. And the next day I started my own courtroom. And who was the judge you sat with? I sat with uh, Judge Roland Candy. And I'll, I'll never forget that. I said, what, how do you know what this is worth? Because that was a thing, because they'd have the pre-trials and say, well, I'll give you a bullet with a promise. And I'm thinking, what's a bullet with a promise? That's a Prop 215 hearing and a preliminary. What is all this? And a bullet is one year in county jail with the promise of no state prison. Wow. And so you learn these things and how it works. And which again is totally different from the federal court with Rule 11 because we are not negotiating or dealing with the attorneys at all. But that's what we did. And that's how I learned what the value is. So there's no baby judges school? and Well, or, there is actually. Um, in fact, um, the state court, I have to say, has had a very robust program, CEDR. California Judicial Education Research. And as soon as you're appointed, you go in for um, a five days of um, ethics and fairness and trial procedure. And then a year later, you go to the two-week judicial college, which at the time was at UC Berkeley. And that's where you, after you've gotten to know some things, but. The two, the baby judge school, the two, the five days was, um, that was interesting, very, because <clears throat> almost, there were maybe 10 or 12 of us, and almost everyone there had been appointed and felt that they had, at the pinnacle of their career, they had, you know, they were fair, they were honest, and, but they did a lot of work with um, fairness. And something that I went through that I've always remembered is that they took us and separated us into two equal groups and gave us a hypothetical. And that was um, a person comes home to find their significant other in the arms of another person. There's alcohol involved. Um, physical violence ensues. Phone is ripped out of the wall. A lot of things, you know, such as this. What would you sentence a person to? Probation, zero to three months, three to six months, six to nine to 12. And we all sat and talked about it individually. And uh, we came back into the room together to discuss what our findings were and what we were going to sentence to. And very quickly it became obvious that one group was probation, and the other group was six to nine months jail. And everyone couldn't figure out what was the difference. And finally, someone said, well, you know how those hot-blooded Latin men are with their woman, and they, the other group says, what do you mean, men? No, this was an Irish female. Her name was Catherine O'Leary. And they go, what? What happened? 
Catherine O'Leary got probation, Jose Rodriguez got six to nine months. And it was a, it was a major event for everyone to think, wow, there are certain perceptions, preconceived notions that people have that think that they're the fairest that they can be. And, and here was this, and, and, and it, it shocked everyone. And it was one of the greatest exercises that I've ever been through. And in fact, I actually taught for the remainder of my time on the state court in that program because I was so impressed by it, is that you always have to look and think and do a double check on yourself. Would I want to be standing in front of me as a judge? And am I going to just assume things automatically? And that's always had an impact on me. That's fascinating. It's, it was absolutely amazing to see what happened. And I mean, the, the discussions were, they were going at it. And it wasn't until the end when they showed the differences. And it was strictly based upon gender and ethnicity. And nothing that was said about it, it was just... The mindset. You, it's, it's just the concept, what you do. Yeah. An expectation. An expectation, and that has always been in the back of my mind as being a judge. I mean, you can't look at people. You know, we talk about things that people come in sometimes and they have a hat on in court. You, you know, you can't just yell and say, get that hat off in my courtroom. Because maybe the person is in cancer treatment. Maybe the person has a major issue and they're trying to, you know, keep it private and so you just, I, I mean, I think that to me is kind of the philosophy. And like I said, it, my philosophy has always been what I want to be standing in front of me. I mean, that's, I think that's it because I've been as in the times I did go to court as an attorney, there were times that I thought I got hometown. And then I thought there were times that they bent over backwards to take care of me and I felt bad. I thought, this isn't fair. Mm -hmm. It's just not fair. Um, and in trying to talk to people who want to be judges, I always say that you need to have a philosophy, you know, and at some point you've got to develop a judicial philosophy. Mine is to follow the law regardless of what I think about it and um, to rule according to the law and to do so timely. And that's where it is. Whatever happens, happens, and you go from there. Do you remember your first uh, day on the bench in Superior Court? Yes. It was a um, preliminary hearing of a young boy that had been murdered by his mother. He had been actually had been taken away. It was a dependency court. It was a juvenile matter. And I knew of the case, but I was at a pro tem level when it started and they put him back in the, uh, in the home and she had him chained to the toilet in the bathroom and he had to drink the toilet water. I mean, it was just horrible and he uh, ended up dying and that was the case I had. And it was extremely high profile and I had learned about you know, uh, pool cameras and how to do this and you know, because in state court we could have uh, photographers, et cetera and to work on that, but it was a very, very tough case to deal with. And that was one of my first ones. And then from then on, I went into criminal felony trials. But because of that case, they needed to open a new juvenile courtroom. And I volunteered to take that. So I went to juvenile court for two years to open that courtroom up and give more relief to the people there. <clears throat> Interesting. Did you, did you ever have any interaction with, um, with Judge David Kenyon from Los Angeles? He was very much, before he went on to the federal bench in the Central District, he was very much involved in... Um, no. I he was on the state court and, and uh, was involved in establishing a uh, juvenile justice center in South Central. I have heard of that center, yes, so, but I did not personally have I an see. involvement. I was just curious. So tell me, um, uh, uh, you're, you're on the Superior Court bench and, and um, uh, somehow you come to the attention of um, the president. How, tell me how you got to the federal bench. Well, um, 
Judge Carlton, who's just passed, went senior in um, 1999, and President Clinton nominated a person to fill the seat. It would have been the first female on the Eastern District of California, but because of political issues, for two years, nothing happened. And when President Bush was um, sworn in, of course, that nomination died. Um, the Republican Party in California with the senators, Boxer and Feinstein, decided that they needed to do something so they wouldn't have these hold up. So they created a, a six-person panel, three Republicans, three Democrats. And whoever would get through with at least four votes, the majority, would not have a blue slip pulled on them if they got through. So I was with a, in a group um, in a court meeting, and I'll never forget that I was asked, if you were to get called and asked to apply, would you? And I'm thinking, what, why would I do this? I'm loving the Superior Court. I'm in, I mean, we had vacation days. I mean, <laughs> 25 days a year, and I had sick leave. I had all those wonderful things. And uh, when you went on vacation, your courtroom was dark. You had one case, you were done, you walked out, that was it. And so I'm thinking the federal court. And the interesting thing was I knew it was Judge Carlton's position, and I'd only been to federal court one time, and that was in a settlement conference with Judge Carlton. With a lot of attorneys here from San Francisco and LA, and I said, if this is not what I want to do, this is different, this is very tough. But I said, you know what, I'll look at it. I mean, you never say no to something, and I thought, I'll look at it. And so I did get a phone call from someone, and I said, okay, I will apply. And I did. And the interesting thing was I had also been asked to apply for the California Appellate Court. So I had two applications going, and um, I, it, I started reading up on the federal system and I started to really like this. And I remember the interview and uh, I got through the interview. I got six votes. And I remember reading one day, I got up in the morning, read the paper in Sacramento Bee and it said another person had been selected for the position and that I came in second. I got to court that day received a phone call from the head of the Republican Party in California and said, uh, did you read the paper today? And I said, yes. He goes, that's not true. We want you to fly down tomorrow for an interview. Well, I did. And this is around, two, this is 9-11 time. And uh, I went down to LA and interviewed. And they said, you'll probably hear something from the White House. Okay, well, by the time I got that call, it was probably end of October because Reagan was still shut down. I had to fly into Dulles and I interviewed with um, uh, the senior, the White House counsel, Alberto Gonzalez, who soon became the attorney general, and interviewed there and thought, well, we'll see what happens. And in January, I got the call. You're the presumptive nominee. So start the FBI background check. And that was, as I'm sure everyone tells you, that was sure fun. <laughs> <laughs> one of the more enjoyable times of your life. Um, but uh, that's how it happened. I see. I see. Well, uh, how did your confirmation hearing go? Um, it went fairly well by the time we got there. There was a hold that had been placed on. Um, Senator McCain had a hold on uh, nominations because of uh, campaign finance reform. Mm. Interesting. So I finally got a hearing and uh, I had a couple things to have to deal with because I had had a case in Superior Court that dealt with um, the State Bar of California dues, which the State Bar at the time had a number of programs that they promoted and took, added to your dues. 
volunteers and parole and this and women in this and the, you know, all the different things. And um, I had the case, it was a bench trial, and I ruled that um, no, it's, it's a Supreme Court made it very clear that if you have to pay in order to practice a profession, you can't add other political type programs. And so I cut those out and it was interesting that uh, that was what I got asked about at my confirmation hearing. So judge, what do you have against women and minorities practicing law in California? <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. It was just a matter of Keller versus State Bar was the precedent from the Supreme Court that I had to follow. But uh, it went actually went very well overall. And uh, did one of the you at California senators introduce you, Senator uh, Feinstein? She chaired the meeting that day. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was very good. And we have I have a wonderful picture with her. Um, she was very, very, very nice and. Uh, in fact, I was the last person confirmed before they went on August recess. It's back in the days when you had uh, windows and the blue screen of death. Yes. I was in court and uh, I knew it was the last day and I said, okay, it's 12 noon here, it's 3 o'clock in D.C. And they were jumping all, they were doing cloture votes for everyone and they took forever. And so at the very end, they said, we need to get three people through. And they, con they had a little conference and with Leahy, Senator Feinstein, and others, and Senator Hatch. And they said, okay, here's the numbers. And I knew that my number was 888. And they said, we're going to do whatever, 234, 567, and 888. And I thought, oh, my God, it's me. Well, at that exact moment, my Windows 3.1 computer went to the blue screen of death. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching it on C-SPAN. Uh -huh. So I'm now going, tr tracking everything through, ended up unplugging the whole thing, plugging it back in, and you can imagine how long it took to boot up, and then to get to C-SPAN, and then to get the buffering out so that it would finally get to play. And I saw at the very end, my name come up at the bottom of the screen, and I said, all in favor, aye. Any opposed? He is confirmed, and we are adjourned. And I, wow, what happened? And within two minutes, the White House called. Mm -hmm. and said, you're confirmed. And the Justice Department called, and, and that was it. That's great. Yeah, it just, you know, after all the things that happened, it was just uh, amazing how that went through. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, we're kind of running out of time, but there's one case, and, and, and we really haven't had a chance to talk about your cases. Um, and if you're willing to tell us a little bit about it, I'm, uh, I want to ask you about um, Sierra Pacific Industries and the Moonlight Fire case. Is that something you can talk about? Well, it is still pending right oh, now. Okay. Um, I wasn't clear about I that. wasn't really involved. It was, it, uh, there were a number of things that happened, and I know that it was, it was the issue recusal, is that what you're... Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, there was a lot of confusion that was happening at that point in time, but uh, one of our judges stepped up and said, I have no problem doing that. And it's still going as far as I know, but it's extremely contentious. And um, I have not been, I've had parts of it on insurance coverage and different things, but. I was never actually in the actual trial itself. And I was trying to do what uh, word of mouth had said from my colleagues, I don't want to do this, this is too, because it had allegations with the U.S. Attorney's Office who we're dealing with constantly and you know, other judges, and so do you really want to be in the middle of this case? I personally didn't, um, and a number of my colleagues said to me that they did not want to. And that's what led to the order, which was then eventually came back and said, we need to go through and see if there's anyone first on your court before we go outside. When the dust settles on that case, we'll come back to it one of these days. Yes. And we'll hear what you have to say. Um, I believe in 2006, you became a regent of the University of Pacific. Yes. Um, and this year, 
you gave a commencement address. Yes, I did. What was that like? It was very interesting. Uh, to start in 2006 and go through my nine-year term and to give the commencement address to the people and I thought it was a very fitting way to end my term because I get a chance to talk to the students about how much I love the university and what it means to me and the people that I am still very, very close with. That, that, that university um, it made it for me. It, it was it was unbelievable. Like I said, I had a, my law advisor there, it was absolutely amazing, and we spent a lot of time together. And uh, the university had even done a, a story on the two of us together as my mentor, and I, it was just wonderful to be able to relate that to him and to everything that I of who I am. The Pacific is such a very close-knit organization and I still have friends. My best friends are the ones that I went to school with in college. In fact, when I first got here Sunday night, the first thing we did was meet up with one of my buddies. And it's, uh, it, was a, it was very moving and uh, I was very honored to have that opportunity to speak to the graduates and uh, actually try to impart some of the things that I felt about it. It was good. Well, Your Honor, I, I've enjoyed chatting with you this afternoon. And, and um, uh, one last question. Uh, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you want to tell us? No, I think that uh, being in the federal court as an Article III judge is just something that uh, I will always remember. It's a highlight. You know, there was a time I was being considered for the California Supreme Court, and I had to actually think about this. As I was meeting with Governor Schwarzenegger and thinking, would you go from the federal court back to the state court? I know some of my colleagues have done that. And this is the highlight of my career. I, I don't want to go anywhere else. I, want, I love being a district judge. It's the, it's the pinnacle of my career. And I have an absolutely fabulous staff. I love being in the Ninth Circuit. I love everything about it and I don't think that I could ever ask for anything more professionally. I'm done. Made it. I don't know how. I still look and think how in the world did I get here? I don't, I just don't know. Of course, I'm, I, you know, my old saying is, you know, every once in a while even a blind squirrel finds an acorn, so I'm <laughs> I lucked out. <laughs> I think it's more than that. Uh, I, think, I think the cream rises to the top. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for your time this, uh, today, and um, uh, I really appreciate it. My pleasure. This has been great talking to you. Good. Thank you.